Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Seeds of Liberty podcast, episode 12. Uh, you can find us on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter uh, on theseedsofliberty.com. So today Bam. we have Cynthia Wells, uh, anarchist. She's a manager of New Gateway um, Volunteers and Anarchists Facebook page. Um, and today we're going to talk about um, what it's like being a black anarchist and uh, maybe perhaps get into a little bit of the drug war and her, uh, her views on that. So, uh, so Cynthia, welcome to the show. Um, Thanks for having me. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for coming on. So, so can you, uh, why don't we start with um, how you became a, an anarchist? Uh, it's good just to get some background. Okay. Um, I have a friend who was talking to me a little bit about government here and there, and he never really elaborated on his views on government. But one day he asked me, was I free? And I was like, well, yeah, of course. I live in America. Of course I'm free. And he was like, no, no, really. Are you free? And I was like, well, I mean, I guess. He said, can you get married to whoever you want? And I was like, well, you know, the whole gay marriage thing. And he was like, what happens if you grow weed? I was like, you go to jail. He was like, so again, how free are you? And so he said, look, when people hear the word anarchism and anarchy, they automatically think chaos and there's going to be, you know, the purge, stuff like that happening. But actually, you know, I've gotten a lot of peace out of anarchy because, you know, it's me governing myself and making more decisions for myself instead of having to think about, oh, is this legal instead of is this right? You know, so my friend told me, he was like, you're an anarchist. You just don't know it. He says everyone is an anarchist, but they don't know what they are yet. I was like, okay. He said, well, just think about it. You know, when you're at home by yourself or when you're at home with your family or your friends, you know, is, is there a cop or someone sitting there telling you what you had, what you can and can't do? And I was like, of course not. He was like, okay, well, you know, is there anyone telling you that you can and cannot smoke? You know, right now, and I was like, well, no. He was like, everybody's home is their own anarchy. They just don't know what it's called. So that's how I became an anarchist. It's been that's about a awesome. year. Any, awesome. any like books or personalities or, or people, uh, like podcasts that, that, that influence you? Of course, you guys. You know, oh. I watch the. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, yes. You guys <laughs> talking to you. I've been knowing you guys for almost a year now and so after about a year of knowing you guys I'm like man you know this is amazing <laughs> I made a whole group of new friends and a whole group of friends that actually make sense and if you guys think about what I'm saying you know that having friends that make sense is really 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 comforting because most of our friends and family members don't make sense and you know they're still stuck in that that status box you know that that you have to have somebody there to tell you that you can't do this or you can't do that you're not supposed to rape you're not supposed to murder it's like yeah that's already a given and anarchism is you know all the other stuff that you're supposed to be able to do without having restrictions and legislation and all this other bullshit tell you what to do so yeah that's awesome dude. it is it's, it's it's right that you know your home you know I mean our personal lives are dominated by anarchy that's that's the thing that most people need to understand most decisions in your life are not government approved <laughs> or government regulated right they're dominated by your own conscience but people don't tend to think of those things in terms of of anarchy it's like if the government were to try to regulate relationships in terms of who you can you know who you can uh, be in a relationship with like specifically like like you know pair people together people obviously would revolt but when they when they regulate businesses they're like you know yeah they, 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 that's okay because <laughs> because he might be he might be evil you know <laughs> yeah you know and and people anarchism isn't being accepted widely because it doesn't have some sort of religious backing to it you know you have the democrats and you know their whole 
they don't know if they're atheists, Christians, or just, I don't know. I don't even know what's wrong with those people. But then you have the conservatives, and everybody knows they're Christian. You know? It, anarchism is, is, you get to choose whatever you want. And it's up to you to make the correct decision for yourself. You know, you're not making it for somebody else. And that's what everybody, everybody's become so dependent on decisions being made for them that they've lost the, they've lost their instincts to make decisions for themselves. Like since anarchism, you know, a lot of my senses have been picked up. I'm able to read people a little bit differently. You know, when you're not under that programming and everything, you start to see people in a whole new light. Yeah, you, you do. One hundred percent. You you see people. It's it's depressing. <laughs> it is because uh, they're in a cage, and you're that you, they, they they think that they're voluntarily in that cage, but uh, they're not. And you realize that I'm in the cage as well. But there's I see the gun. Yeah. You yeah. don't. I'm yeah. get. I'm trying to get you to see the gun. That's all I'm doing. Yeah. And you're you're getting mad at me because. Government has replaced God, what traditionally what God has been used for, our religion has been used for in human society. Government replaced that when kings and clergy and all that went away. There's still some backwards-ass society that lets God, or religions are essentially the government. You know, you look at Iran, you look at, you know, uh, Saudi Arabia, etc., etc. Those are still the government, but... You know, in the Western world, in the, democ the democracy world, whatever, the government is God. And so when you talk to these people that are still stuck in that paradigm, they fight back with religious fervor as if you just told someone that, you know, uh, Buddha is the true God and your God is false. So they, they have this blowback and they just don't, they can't, it, they can't see past their indoctrination. And that's, you, that's that's what what I see people now for. I immediately pick up if they have a critic if they can critically think. If if you ask them a question instead of giving some textbook answer that they learned and they've just decided that that issue in their head is solved, resolved, file it in a cabinet because there's nothing else to learn about it. I'm looking for those people that when I ask them a question they go, huh, I've never thought about that. I'm gonna have to get back on you. And that's what you find more when you start talking to anarchists. You start talking to people who are digging into philosophy, for sure. And it uh, it, it blows your mind, kind of, when you talk to people that just... It's like they just want to bury their head in the sand, and they just... Man, I'm, I'm all I'm worried about is my next beer, dude. It's like that's all they want to hear. And it's, it's really sad. <clears throat> and a lot of them... And which, what makes it even sadder... Is that it's people that are close to you. And you're like, look, <clears throat> the God that you're worshiping is not the God you think it is. You know, yes, you are worshiping God, gold, oil, and drugs. Because that is what every, you know, people try to tell me that, oh, yeah, you know, Christianity and you should do this and God and, you know, God tells us to listen to authority and God tells us to do this and everything. And God tells us bigger, better, more, and all this. And I'm like, your God is really greedy. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like our government, you know. Yeah. I'm like, they haven't so, put together self -obsessed, that. Self-obsessed, jealous. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's... And they haven't put together <laughs> that that God is the same God that they're, you know, that that they're being taught to worship. And see, here's where being black and anarchist comes into play. A lot of black people are religious. A lot of black people worship God, love God and everything. And, you know, you try to talk to black people about the government and God at the same time. And they think of it as two separate entities. But they don't realize that the God that they are worshiping, which I try to tell them all the time, I'm like, you know, the same God that you guys are praying to, worshiping, saying that's going to deliver you and save you and everything, do you not realize that this is the same God that was indoctrinated and ingrained and beaten into your people 400 years ago. You know, the same people that, you know, you're supposedly fighting against the awful white people, you know, that are currently enslaving us, they're the ones that taught you this God, and yet you still hold on 
to the same ridiculous oh, beliefs. Man. I was talking to my brother, uh, the youngest one, who is a staunch Christian, calls me every day, tells me I need to read about Jesus. And I asked him, I said, I said, brother, if you were born in India instead of America or Britain or wherever else, if you were born in India, how could you tell me that you wouldn't be a Hindi and you wouldn't view Christianity as a false religion and he said well i guess i couldn't but eventually hopefully i would see the light of jesus and i'm like do you not understand how ridiculous that you just sound like it's re what religion you are is largely based off your geographical uh you know where you're born and yeah there are some there's some cases where like a jew converts to being a muslim and a muslim converts to being a christian like th there's oddballs that happen right yeah. People get swayed due to emotions and fear. Uh, but largely, you look at a map per uh, or, uh, dissected by religion, and there's just huge big blots of one religion. Yeah. And, and you see that it's more of a consequence of what religion you were, uh, believe in than a you finding it on your own to be truth. There you go. You know, and... And people don't realize, I'm like, you guys are taught this stuff. When have you really actually had time for self-discovery? You know, when have you actually really took time out of, you know, worshiping at a church or listening to the Osteens? Oh my God, I'm in Texas, y'all. And the Osteens are it. I am in Lakewood, Texas. I mean, it is, it's in Houston. It's awful. I mean, traffic everywhere, horrible. Your God is terrible. Your God is bad. Yes, I am going to say it. Your God is the government. And well, the so government has tricked you into believing that it is this religion. And now you're celebrating on certain days. You're doing things on certain days. Certain days, this has to happen. Like, really, really, really <clears throat> think about it. Hump day, throwback Thursdays. I mean... This shit is being ingrained more and more into people. I mean, people are becoming more and more programmed, and the more programmed they become, the less they realize it. People think that this Orwellian, you know, it's going to be flying cars and shit. I'm like, no. You're already sitting here looking at a screen talking to somebody halfway across the country, halfway across the world, people talking to people in space. I mean, all kinds of stuff. But, well, you know... Another... another thing to talk about here is uh go up to the next time anybody that's hearing this and i'd love to see jeremy do this because this would be funny for him to record is uh i would like to next time you meet somebody that's staunch christian right um ask them uh what they would be more afraid of cursing god um or using his name in vain or breaking a commandment or planning and running a cocaine factory out of their house which one do you actually fear more <laughs> planning and running a cocaine <laughs> exactly so if 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 the god that you believe in to be the ultimate authority in your life is superseded by another one then he's not your god yeah i mean well, I don't... Well, that, that, I mean, I mean, if that's... God exists and he can smite you down right now. Yeah, he could. Wouldn't that be a hell of a lot scarier me just saying, God damn? I, I, I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> than me growing fucking 20,000 kilograms of cocaine in the, you know, some backwoods fucking house. Like, seriously. Like, what's more dangerous to my health? Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, why, I, well, that's why I refer to the... You know the the status that um especially as you said earlier cynthia you know the the democrats especially a lot of them consider themselves atheists but i, I refer to all of them as atheists because they are completely ensconced in the religion of government um you know a lot of people it's funny you know especially a lot of the conservatives that i, I run into they will still claim you know i mean they would probably look at at your little test there dave and say it was silly because they don't want anything to do with cocaine anyway, so it has nothing to do with fear, and they would try to to wriggle out of it that way. No, no, no. If you a lot wanted of them, to, well, 
Uh, okay, <laughs> well, that, 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 that makes it different, I guess. Um, but a lot of them still claim to have the higher, have their particular god as the higher authority, mm. but they do still bow down, you know, even, you know, the Tea Party ones are the worst because they're the ones that claim to want freedom the most out of all of them, but they still bow down to the police and yeah. the, the military and you know we can't we can't live without these things you know and that that of course is the enforcement arm of the whole pro of the whole problem <laughs> so yeah yeah we want them to, we want it we want everything else to go away except the power for them to do whatever they want yeah they can keep that that's fine yeah <laughs> but you know they the fact that that they are so enslaved and that they're so close to me and and it's a lot and it's it's honestly harder in the black community because I know a lot of white anarchists. I think me and maybe two or three other black anarchists are the only ones I know exist. I, I'm, I'm a fucking unicorn, you guys. Seriously. <laughs> if you were an ex-cop, it would be... <laughs> Actually, I went to... I went to a high school for law enforcement, criminal injustice, and I went through the law enforcement program, but that's that's about as far as it got. <laughs> I, I really wasn't a cop. That's when I knew that I was not going to be a police officer and that something was really going wrong here because our training, we you kick in the door, no matter what's going on, everybody goes and cuffs everybody to the ground and you have to sort it out after that. Yeah, so, so stupid. Yeah. It's like, uh, well, hold I on, we need to figure out everything. So let me handcuff everyone, set you down, <laughs> and pepper spray you, and then we're going to figure this out. I mean, they really honestly scare you into thinking that the citizens are against you. I, I remember being 17, 18 years old in high school, senior in high school, and we had this large projection screen. And we get this gun that's like an actual gun, but they've taken out the magazine and replaced it with the laser. So it's triggered to work with this projection screen. They had a fireback cannon that would shoot little marbles about that big of plastic. And you had to learn to take cover. I remember scaling the walls, all that shit, and thinking to myself, why am I writing these people tickets? Like, something's really wrong with this. I'm like, I'm not even helping anybody. Why am I arresting this lady? She's just upset. Like, I didn't was, feel uh, like it was that? something really, really wrong. And no. that's when I knew I wasn't going to be a cop. But that's when I kind of started going, okay, maybe cops aren't the best at, you know, everything. And the more I grew up and the more I got arrested, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I learned how shitty the system can be. So, yes, those, I, those truly, those truly negative experiences will definitely help you along that path. Yeah, they will. <laughs> they will. And then, like every time I got arrested, my training came back to me, and I was like, "Oh my God!" You know, if I make a sudden move, he's gonna take out his ass and break my wrist. Because we learned how to take suspects down. I'm five four, maybe a hundred and twenty five hundred thirty pounds. You know, I had to learn how to take down big six foot two guys and stuff like that. You know, they scare you into thinking that this world is this big, scary place. And, you know, I always have to fear for my life. No, you don't need to be a cop if you're in constant fear for your fucking life. That is the opposite. You should not even be close to anyone if you are in constant fear for your life. Go be a farmer. <laughs> yeah. Go live in nowhere. But, you know, they put these people out here and they tell them how scary we are and, you know, how how we're all going to ride up against them and stuff like that. And, and it's not even the case. You know, we just want to be left alone. You know, the, the really amusing part to me is uh, when I learned that uh, that police officers, there's like a, a ceiling to, you know, the IQ that they allow of, of people that enter the law enforcement. And yeah. And to me, what that tells me is that, you know, we're really ruled by idiots, you know, by the stupid people. That's that's who they choose to enforce these laws. Because if you were to actually put somebody in that position that is able to critically think like you <laughs> and and analyze the laws that you're supposed to enforce, you will quickly understand and come to the conclusion, you know what? I'm really increasing the uh, evil in society 
and uh, you know this destructiveness. I'm not decreasing. Any, I'm not saving anybody from crime. You know, I'm not helping people. I'm, you know, it's like I I I find it hard to believe that they drive around these cars with you know the protect and serve motto, and they never really think about it. Like what? <laughs> years yeah. and years and years of work in there, and and you don't think that it's hiding in a bush. You know, with your, uh, with your, uh, you know, speeding, uh, what's it called, the radar gun? Yeah. <laughs> and just, I learned and to just do flagging that. It's people. <laughs> and just flag, like, you don't think that that's immoral after years of doing it? Like, you really think you're helping people? Like, wow. And I honestly. <laughs> hey, I, ticket I, saved lives, dude. Yeah. <laughs> that's the, the stupidest shit I've ever heard in my life. The commercials are so ridiculous. Oh, I just saved your life by writing you a $500 fucking ticket <laughs> for not wearing your seatbelt. <laughs> How did you just help me there, guy? I just I had. I now just I had may that not have the other a place day. to live because yeah. you took five hundred dollars <laughs> that I was going to use to pay rent and stuff with. Thanks. You know, I mean. And then this cop comes out the other day, this ex police chief, and saying that every police department in the country has qu arrest quotas and ticket quotas. Every oh, yeah. one of them. Yeah. And it's like. How do you have an arrest quota? That means that the, the cop has to dig for things to arrest people for. Yeah. They have to lie. Yeah. And it's, so, it's so ridiculous. Like, that's not policing. That's domination. It is policing. It's policy enforcing policing, you know? And I honestly would be okay with peace officers. And people want to say that how would, you know, private security work? We have a private security, we have a security guard in our neighborhood that drives around and patrols. The only reason the cops come and patrol our area is because they have to. If we didn't have, if the cops didn't have to come, we just have that guy armed. He's fine. He does a great job. He doesn't bother anybody. He's not flashing his lights in people's eyes. He's not running up on cars and stuff like that saying, hey, you look too nice to be driving. You look too, you know off to be driving a nice car like this. What are you doing? What are you doing in this neighborhood? You know, all kinds of shit, just harassment. And, and you know what? It goes both ways. I've seen cops pull people over in my neighborhood and say, hey, what are you doing out here? Only, people, only reason why white people come out here is to buy drugs. What are you doing? Why are you over here? And it's like, I have friends that live down the street, really? That sounds too dangerous. Uh, yeah, I, got pulled over. <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't trust any uh, any community that doesn't have a you know a monopoly on violence. You know, fracturing people's arms and raping women and you know murdering people accidentally, shooting their dogs. You know, I, I just <laughs> yeah. I just I don't think I don't think order can be achieved without those things, right? <laughs> I mean, you know, when people say that it's you know total anarchy, they I, I don't understand why they refer to chaos. You know. Anarchy is the most peaceful, it's the most peaceful principle I've ever taken a part in. You know, I've been a part of religion, been a part of everything else. You know, this is, this is pretty peaceful. It's just making decisions on your own constantly. You know, you're not having to say, hey, you know, I, can you please write a law for me because, you know, I need someone to tell me that I can't, I have to ride with my seatbelt on. If a person doesn't want to ride with their seatbelt on, that's the risk they take with their lives. We should not be able, we should not have to tell people, you know. Well, you're not thinking about it through the fascist eyes, right? Yeah. You, you, you got to think Jer about Jer that. Jeremy, please, please tell, share your story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I had this happen the other day. Um, just what was it, a couple of days ago, Monday or Tuesday, I don't even remember now. Uh, I was I was Tuesday. on my way to work, and uh, I did not have my seatbelt on, uh, which I normally criminal. don't. Be, because yeah, exactly. I'm a, I'm a hardened <laughs> criminal, uh, and I was driving along on the way to my first stop of the day, and uh, all of a sudden, the, I saw lights come on behind me, <laughs> and oh, uh, I lo I looked down, and I was like, "You've got to be kidding me!" Because I knew I wasn't actually speeding for once. Um, so the only thing I, I thought it could be, but that meant he had to actually spot me. Um, so he pulled me over and it's funny that you mentioned about, uh, you know, the, the, um, saving lives and stuff. Cause I did get that speech from him because <laughs> he, he asked me, you know, he asked me for his, for my license and my registration and my insurance card and then said to me, uh, oh, you didn't have that seatbelt on when I pulled you over. Cause as soon as I saw the lights on, I quite quickly, of course, slid it on. <laughs> 
Um, Everybody. And, uh, so oh I didn't. God. I didn't say anything because I know enough. You, you can know, go to court also, and fight it. He didn't have photographic evidence. Well, of course, and that's the whole thing because I, I didn't. I responded to him, but I didn't. I didn't, you know, confirm what he said because just like you were also saying before about how they, you know, you're trained to lie. You know, they're, they're basically trained to lie. They are um, in, or, in order to get what what they, you know, what they're what they're after. So they want that you they want you to incriminate y yourself. So you know, of course, I didn't respond to that. I just said, oh, you know, I kind of mentioned that I was in a hurry to get to work, but for once, I had actually taken the key. I turned the car off and taken the keys out and thrown them on the dashboard and was being all law abiding and putting my hands on the, you know, which I never do on the steering wheel. Um, but I was very pleasant with them, and because of that, he actually got back to me with my ticket in under two minutes, which is like unheard of, because I'm usually there at least 20, 30 minutes well, when this happens. Yeah. At the end of the month, not... he's got to make a quarter. But he came back, and I asked him if he if he had a minute and he was willing to talk. So I decided to start asking him questions. And first, I, I went after the quota thing, and I started to say, because he said, you know, just just so you know, it's click it or ticket week, so uh, you, you might want to <laughs> keep it on this week. And I said, you're serious, right? He goes, well, it is. And I said... And you don't think that that equates to a quota system? Well, no, because it's, you know, it, it saves lives. And then he wanted to debate me on, you know, the, the numbers of how many people. I said, how many people actually fly out of their, you know, because the whole, the whole idea behind it originally was that people would get ejected from their cars in, in, in massive accidents and then hurt other people along the way. And yeah. he, gave, like, it, he was literally, like, reading from, I mean, he was actually a very pleasant guy, one of the nicest Character-wise, you know, fascist. I've ever, you know, run into. <laughs> he was very pleasant, very, very, very. Most uh, pleasant fascist I've ever met. <laughs> yes, but he gave. He literally. It was like he was reading out of a playbook because he gave me everything, and he said, "Oh, it saves lives." Did you ask him and... what would happen if he refused to pay the fine? Yeah. Well, yeah. No, he told. Well, he told me I was free to do all these things because I asked him about. I asked him about authority and you know where where he got this authority to do this and why it didn't. And he even you know he was another one. He admitted that there's lots of laws that he doesn't agree with, but then he fell right back onto the law is the wow, law thing. And, really? Oh my. Yeah, God. but 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 then he right away before I could even get into that, he right away went into well, you know, it's still the law and you have to follow it. If if you want to change things, you know, go up go up to Albany and and oh and God. fight the legislators there. And I'm like I'm like you I'm like you honestly you right, hear what you're country. saying, right? I'm like you want me to well, all because I want to drive and assume a risk on my own because he said because that's what he asked me what what would happen you know if you fly out of the car and die. Well, then my family's well. on the hook, and it's, it sucks for them, you know, yeah. for payment. If, if somebody, you know, it's like, and the, what I left him with, which is the one thing that I think finally caught him off guard, because everything I said to him, every question I asked, he just gave the canned answers of, you know, I don't, I, I don't write the laws, I just enforce them. I don't agree with all the laws, but they're I don't the just kill the Jews. I, I just kick them into the mass <laughs> graves. Want to stop a black cop? Ask him he, if, this, if segregation was legal, would he enforce it? See, you know what? Ooh, nice. It was a black cop, and I'm so mad we didn't have this conversation. Wow. I, I got cussed out. Oh my god! I didn't think, is that I didn't think, well, I, I just left uh, him with cause well, he, he, fugitive he went, slave laws. Well, any of, any of those. <laughs> oh, any of the Jim, Jim Crow laws, you know. It's but the, like, the point was that he he didn't, you know, he he kept sidestepping everything. But then I finally left him with, um, you know, these. These, these, you know, pulling people over for stuff like a seatbelt, you know, you're basically saying it's because of what if could happen, right? And he said, well, yeah, you know, statistically, what if could happen that we, we need to have laws for that? And I said, have you ever seen my Minority Report? And he said, yeah, I love that movie. I said, can you please explain to me? Can, <laughs> can, you, please ex <laughs> can you please explain to me how, how what you just said right. to me is any different than a thought crime? And he paused for a second and said, fuck. Oh, you just made and him look, fart in his brain. And, and look down and goes, I'm going to have to think about that one. And at that, I, at that, I was like, you know oh what? Oh, my I'm God, already, you planted a seed. A 10-minute conversation. I'm like, all right, I got to go anyway. So I said, listen, I, I don't want to take up any more. I was very pleasant. So I don't want to take up any more time. And then he stuck his hand out to shake my hand, which an Ooh. officer. And you didn't never, plug never, a podcast? What? I, I yes, Dave. I, I I shouted it as he was walking away. Um, but you know, but like I said, it's just funny because they, they're in that mindset. Seeds of Liberty .com. <laughs> <laughs> So. Oh my God. So, but it's the whole the whole idea of you know ticketing me for something that 
I could have done if I got into an accident, you know, yeah. on a road that was thir- that, with a 35 mile an hour speed limit where I was only traveling about 37 to begin with. I'm like, if I got, if I got into an accident, would I be launched for, through my windshield and kill somebody? No. no. So it's what if, and that's what everybody, everybody's always so afraid of the what if, and that's hey, why. In orders, man. And the collective thinking. See, that's another thing that's rampant in the black community is we all feel like, you know, oh, we have to look out. I have to look out for somebody because they have the same care, you know, the same features as I do. No, I don't have to look out for anybody. I don't have to look out for you. I don't have to look out for the little kids on the porch and shit like that. I don't have to look out for the little rugrats and porch monkeys with diapers and shit like that. I don't have to look out for anybody but myself and my family. That's it. And I'm looking out for my community at the same time. But I don't have to take care of a bunch of people by force because, you know, I have to because I have to be a part of something. I don't have to be a part of this group. You know, I don't want to be a part of a group of people just because we have the same features and stuff like that. You could be a group of assholes and we all look alike, you know. (laughs) Yeah, but yeah, just, they they they're really gotten into they're really into this collective thinking that you know we all have to look out for each other and the man's against the white man's against us and everything and I my dad was talking to me about this the other day and I told him I was like okay think about this dad I was like you know how many white people actually live in this neighborhood he was like eh, maybe five percent of this neighborhood is white you know there's a few white people here and I was like you know. Are they the ones dumping trash and leaving stuff hanging around the community? He's like, no, you know, black people in our own community. And I was like, well, what about the stores and stuff like that? We have burglar bars on our stores and stuff. It's ridiculous. You know, they're store owners as well, you know, and you're trying to attack the stores in your own community. Well, we've gotten into this collective thinking and our collective thinking is we all have to stick together no matter what, no matter if they're good or bad or whatever. We all have to believe in God. We all have to believe in the same God. We all have to think the same. We all have to look the same. We all have to act the same. But, you know, we really are all different, even though we have same characteristics and stuff like that. And you may not click with somebody with the same features as you. You might get along better with a group of people that are completely different from what you are. But this collective shit has got to stop. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's got really, really, really bad. I associate with the non-bearded all the time. And it, <laughs> it goes against a lot of what I believe. And, uh, Danilo I, I, could, gets, I could be among you, but I choose not to. <laughs> Danilo, get, he gets a pass because of the soul patch. And then Jeremy... Uh, it's it's. Uh, I didn't, Jer- Jeremy I has an t- attempted beard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, I was thinking about making my own religion, uh, and, and and following it with the state called uh, beardism, so I could never be forced to shave my beard uh, at a you know for a job. Oh my god! That way I could uh, be like, you're oppressing me. <laughs> this goes against beardum. Uh. <laughs> you have to have holidays. Oh yeah, every every Friday is a holiday. Oh, see? Stroke your beard day. There, there you go again, Dave. Looking looking to use the violence of the state against people. Hey man, see, everyone's now, this, everyone's I'm doing it. I can't grow a beard. So, what am I supposed to do? Buy one. And just Aww. tape it on. See, another way to keep the black man out. Way to go, Dave. Just grow a, <laughs> just grow a mustache. You're a woman. Aww. See, and now you want to bring that up. Feminism. It's, it's oh my god. Of, it's kind of patriarchal, gender, I will admit. This this church would only have a 100% male. Uh... Oh my god, I am confident in this. 100%. So, so, you, so you are openly discriminating against any bearded women no, out there? No, no. I mean, if any bearded woman wants to join, that's fine with me. But fact is, most bearded women were just, you know, men. So. Uh. <laughs> So, uh, J- Jeremy, I, Jeremy, I, I want to go back back uh, when you were talking about the seatbelt laws because uh, I think that's kind of in the same category as like drunk driving laws and you know speed limit laws and and I got into conversation with with uh, you know a few of my family members on this topic and it's very interesting because like so you you were saying it from the perspective of thought crime but when I talk to people about this I usually say like if if I 
if I choose to drive without a seatbelt and it's dangerous, that's my personal decision. Now, if I don't care about death, if that doesn't frighten you, what makes you think that, you know, a fine or a piece of paper is going to prevent people from doing that? If they don't even care about killing themselves. And the same thing goes with drunk driving. If people are idiots, stupid enough to get behind the wheel while they're drunk, right? I mean, I, I assume they should have friends that should prevent them from doing that. But, but if they're stupid enough to do that, then what do you think a drunk a law against drunk driving will do to you know to hinder them right <laughs> it serves no useful purpose but but uh robbing people who are in their right mind and maybe had like one beer or something and they can drive fine and they you know and robbing them will not improve societal you know uh welfare <laughs> whatsoever <laughs> so that's well, my that's angle the- no, that that makes sense. It's it's the balancing of the scales thing where they try to, you know, th- their defense will be that, well, yeah, okay, fine, those people you can't help no matter what. But all the other people, you know, like, sure, maybe some of them only had one, but there's plenty of others that get caught and you get them off the road and it lowers the chances of everything else. And it's still like, but you're still punishing people who haven't, other people who haven't done anything wrong with yeah. this giant net that's supposed to, you know, solve everything. And it's that, it's that mentality. It's, it's the same thing behind the, you know, the gun legislation. Same thing. Yeah, you know, if we that... could just, if we could just save one child, so we'll limit everybody else and the severely and... mentally challenged. And, and see, that brings up a bigger point, you know? You bring up, the, you have these gun laws and everything, right? And especially, like, up there in New York with the, you know, the Yankees and shit. But <laughs> there are more people getting robbed. Up there. I promise you, there are not muggers down here in Texas running around snatching purses because grandma might pull out a, a pistol from her garter and bust you in, the back, in your back, you know? Like... <laughs> Criminals don't care about the laws, so they're creating more criminals with regular people. You know, we we're not the ones that need the gun laws and stuff like that. The criminals aren't going to care about obtaining a gun and shit like that. They're not going to say, "Oh, let me go get this registered before I go out and go rob this 7-Eleven." You know what I'm saying? You know, so these all these laws have become obsolete because I'm like, you know, people are going to do what they want regardless. There are laws against drunk driving. There's still people that die from drunk driving. There's still people that get arrested from, you know, driving drunk. So having laws against said drunk driving and stuff like that isn't preventing anything. So they basically... We'll we'll get rid of murder. We'll just make it illegal. Yeah. (laughs) It's like, oh, yeah, you know, murders. That way. Okay, so what we're going to do is (laughs) we're going to tell people not to kill people. I'm like, but still, people die and people are killing people. So, what did you solve? Absolutely nothing. You know, it's everybody feels like the big the government can save them from some big boogeyman that's either gonna snatch them in the hell or come bomb them from overseas or something like that. Like everybody thinks that something big and scary is going to come after them and anarchism makes you realize there's no boogeyman okay everything you do everything everybody else does is a decision and each decision they have make you know has a consequence that follows it if you make a stupid decision bad shit's going to happen to you make good decisions good things will happen to you i mean this 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 caveats directly into our second topic i guess the drug war or the war on drugs and how it's not only immoral it's not legitimate at all and uh it's a hopeless boondoggle that has really only done one thing it's not stop drug use it's uh increased the power of the state uh to an um to a further than an orwellian uh dream uh you know before the drug war you know police officers they didn't have to worry about the drug drug war you know they didn't have to worry about stopping all that it was uh they protect the you know i'm not giving cops a pass here because they still survive off of theft but uh for the most part they they you know protect the population that was their job now it's you know the drug war and then all this other stuff getting it just keeps adding up and adding up and adding up to where you might as well say cops are the military at this point, just enforcing politicians' will. They're not 
protecting anybody. You can't protect someone from them from themselves. Like if I'm gonna go, if I'm gonna get this knife right here and cut my fucking throat right now, uh, I'm gonna do it. There's no amount of policing that can stop that. I mean, unless they lock me up in a loony bin, and and then I, I mean, if I want to hurt myself, I'm still gonna find a way. But but Dave, suicide is illegal. You know. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. So illegal. You're gonna go to jail. <laughs> They're gonna handcuff you after you slit your throat, Dave. The, the, way the, to the go. Fact the fact that it actually is in some places is so beyond ridiculous. That is I was just, the dumbest thing I've ever I was heard. Just, I was just reading something. I can't remember. I was reading some article the other day that happened to mention that. And I was like, I had forgotten about that fact. I'm like, yeah, there are places that it's illegal. <laughs> just you know, call the that, cops and pull a cell phone out of your pocket really quick when they get there. Like, yeah. I'm going to shoot you. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah Suicide well. by cop. Yes. Yeah. It sucks. And people think that, oh, yeah, the police, they're going to protect everybody because, you know, people are suffering and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no, all this proactive policing is doing nothing but filling cages and keeping the perpetual slavery going. I mean, you know, people get thrown in prison over bags of weed. I mean, think about this. You have to find the weed man, okay? The weed man doesn't seek you out. So, yeah. <laughs> so you know, unless that's some proactive he, weed man, right? <laughs> yeah, you know, like why is he being sent to prison and shit like that? Because the because everybody was out seeking him. I he mean, wasn't doing anything wrong. People came to him. He was engaging in voluntary interactions, and that's extremely a, that, voluntary interactions. That's, that's a big no. Well, I mean, with the, the whole state's uh, the whole drug, not getting a cut. Well, yeah, that's part of the problem, and you know. And the, if they were getting a cut, it would be immoral. Yeah. I well, mean, the only reason the drug war was approved and signed on by Richard Nixon and and whatnot was he based it off of morals. We we can't let this. <laughs> Nixon, I'll, I'll tell you what Nixon's gonna do. He's gonna fix the morals yeah. of the USA. <laughs> yeah, well, we've said it a bunch of times on this show. You can't legislate morality, and they just keep trying. I mean, the whole, really the whole. Do. The whole drug road thing, obviously, it all started with the the slippery sl with a slippery slope argument of you know first it was it was cannabis where they demonized that um, you know basically because uh, you know people like uh, William Randolph Hearst uh, you know the paper magnet back in the 30s and 40s uh, wanted to protect his industry from hemp. Um, and other people like him, and that's why they, it was it was originally going to be outlawed. And they they got they you know made stuff like reefer madness and and convinced all the people that you know marijuana was this horrible thing. They even came up with the name marijuana. I mean, most of the stories I've heard all go back to that being the name of a you know just a Mexican weed. They just pulled out of nowhere and to to help with the demonization and coming up with all this. You know, it was it wasn't it like they they said that you know. It was uh, making blacks and Mexicans crazy and making yeah. them rape women and all that stuff. No, no, it was yeah. uh, the way they it sold was. it on the first prohibition, or actually the what it was is they taxed it, and the tax on it was so high that it would be impossible for you to buy it or sell it or make it right. Um, but the, the the reason they passed that is they were saying that it was making white women more have a propensity to want to engage in sexual activities oh, with black men the other way at a higher rate. Yeah, they got hit with that long <laughs> dong. <laughs> so the thing was all of our white women are going to get high and have sex with black guys and we're going to have a mixed race and it's going to be the destruction of white America and <laughs> religious fanaticism. Yeah. yeah. So so they sh they shut that down um even oh. though you know, as we've also discussed before, you know, one minute it was perfectly legal and there was nothing wrong with it. And you could and it was used uh, as, as a medicine in so many different variations yeah. um, for very for a very long time. I mean, up until the point that they officially banned it, you know, it was still listed in the medical journals <laughs> as a as a possible uh, cure or at least, uh, you know, a, a help for like a myriad of different things. Um, and, and, you know, even cocaine, the same thing. It used to yeah. be used as a medicine, you know, for medicinal purposes. Um, 
all yeah, of them. Yeah, all of them. And it, it, it became the whole... Um, you can't put a patent on weed. That's why they. <laughs> but see, that's now that's why like... it's not legal. Honestly, that is. Well, well consider, considering Monsanto has proven that you can now patent seeds, I think uh, I think you actually can patent it at this point. Well, well, have, oh, okay, of course. GMO, right? Mo yeah. Monsanto just made a GMO marijuana, so it, they're going to get the patent for it. And then yeah. I guarantee you, weed's going to be legal as soon as that happens. Monsanto oh. is the devil. No, well, I've 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 always said even even before I even before I found volunteerism that, you know, the drugs would finally be legalized, or at least marijuana, you know, cannabis at the very least would be would be legalized once the government figured out the right way to uh, tax and regulate it. You know that they could make the maximum amount of money, um, and you see that in the in the states that have now legalized it. You know, like well, you, uh, do you know in Colorado the... and Washington where they end up. You know they're they're all touting all this money we're bringing in. It's like yeah, you're ripping these people off. I mean, what's the rate in Colorado? I think it's like 25, 30 percent. They're taxing it. It's like insane. Ooh, damn. You know, it's like it, it's. But you know, like I said, I I thought that the whole time. Once they figured that out, well, we can make money off this. Well, then yeah, and we can regulate it, and we can, we can steer the conversation back through the medical thing. I mean, that's the biggest joke of all. I mean, the the FDA actually even said that the medical marijuana thing um, was, uh, it does have medicinal purposes. Like they, they snuck that in a couple of years ago and they're still acting like the federal law is supposed to be the highest in the land, even though their own organizations are saying, no, it has medicinal purposes. So that automatically takes it off the schedule one platform. Well, every and time yeah. they try to get the, every time that there's, you know, a, an advocacy group tries to get uh, the judges to reclassify it or whatnot or, or open up the hearing for it to be reclassified the judges just to strike it down well of course but they don't but but again if 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 everything that the, <laughs> you know, the hardcore constitutionalists want to believe is true about the constitution and all these laws and the way everything is written well the fact that these organizations are already other organizations and i think the cdc has actually also <laughs> um quietly said this too that it has medicinal purposes which that alone based on all their other bullshit laws um means that it automatically should be taken there should you shouldn't have well, to go if you're to a hardcore judge. constitutionalist you shouldn't believe that the da the huh. fda or the any kind of a exists yeah. well, of course true to be consistent but it just always blows my mind when you look at the top three anti-marijuana anti-drug law um you know lobbyist groups are the private prison uh, owners the cop unions and the prison guard unions because they know the minute those go, those go legal, their businesses go tits up. You're going to need less cops to to uh, protect the people from using these drugs. You're going to need less prison guards because 60, 80 percent in some counties of their drug uh, of their uh, prison population is drug related. That is weed. You, you you lose eighty percent of your prison population. That prison goes completely. To, you're going to be able to buy prisons at cut rate here. I would say within the next five to ten years, maximum security prisons. You're going to be able to buy them and turn them into a paintball course. I guarantee you. <laughs> and uh, um, the the obviously the private prison owners they they get federal grant or federal no bid federal government contracts to uh prop up themselves and the more prisoners they have in there the better so they want every law that they can possibly get on the book yeah i, I like to uh take the angle that uh you know <clears throat> we had we had prohibition right in the 20s and and everybody really understands that that was immoral like how can you not let people smoke you know, or, or, or i cannot let people drink alcohol because they're going to make it in the black market right and that's how the mafia got started <laughs> and, and, and and to illustrate the whole arbitrary nature of law you know i also say that 1932, um, alcohol was illegal and the ownership of gold was legal, right? The very next year, <laughs> alcohol is legal, gold is illegal <laughs> to own. <laughs> and, and then, you know, and, and then people are like, well, but these, these prohibitions, they're the reflection of the people, right? Because the people, we are the government, right? The people influence the politicians, the politicians pass the law, right? So it's the people's progression of, of their understanding of morality and ethics. You know, that's how people kind of, 
try to uh, illustrate it because they they don't seem to see the 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 difference. Like you know, we are government. <laughs> it's like no, when you when you when you get the you know the the, the those lights in your rearview mirror as you're driving, you're, do you say, oh no, that's just me, <laughs> that's right. just me back there. That's just my friend. Don't don't worry about him. <laughs> I mean, you don't even have to turn on the lights when he pull up behind you. You're like, oh shit. Yeah. Please don't pull me over. You don't feel safe when you see a cop. No. You're like, shit, please don't, please, please don't hurt me. Please. I just want to make it another day. Please. Just let me go home. <laughs> That's all I'm asking. <laughs> yeah, but no, yeah, no, yeah. That, that is funny. You know, people, the, arbit uh, the arbitrary, the. I don't know how to say the word. No, the arbitration, the, the just the clear, how clearly arbitrary the laws are for drugs and pretty much any vice law is so ridiculous. Like, like, <laughs> what if a doctor wanted to prescribe alcohol to you? Hey, this might help your liver or your your blood pressure. Drink a <laughs> drink a beer a day or something. They couldn't do that because the government would say no. You know, no, you can't because. It's bad. You know, maybe my sister would be here if they weren't pumping rounds of fucking chemo into her while she was fighting for her life, trying to recover from an aneurysm. They ended up discovering that she had cancer. And so on top of her fighting for her life, you know, just having having an aneurysm, she's trying to fight, her body's trying to recover from chemo. And the chemo is supposed to be helping. You know, maybe she would have got a cannabis treatment. Maybe you would have. She would have been here. I mean, they this greater good shit has got to stop, and that's what everybody is. That's what it all boils down to. Is everybody is like, oh well, it's for the greater good, and and you know, what about so and so's kid, and what about the? That's why they use statistics and stuff like that because people are like, oh my god. That could be me. I could be another statistic, and this can happen to me. And I can go flying through a windshield, and I can go doing this, and I can go doing that. Well, yeah, I could walk okay. outside and get struck by lightning. Should we I ban? Tell should people we? That. Should we ban lightning? Yeah, my daughter was like, "Mom, everybody that's ever been to jail has breathed air. Should we ban air?" I'm like, "No." I said, "You know, grown-ups don't even realize that shit." You. What did that cop say the other day? 100% of all heroin users used milk. <laughs> yeah. We should ban milk. It's a gateway drug. Right? <laughs> you know, I'm well, like, you can't save everybody. And you're not well, supposed yeah. to. Well, yeah, but that that's what I was saying with the slippery slope argument before about how they, they you know, oh, it, th these horrible things could happen if, if you just let this, so we got to nip it in the bud. <laughs> Yeah. And mo most people are blind to it because they just nod along and go, okay. And, you know, Danilo, what you were talking about with the, you know, the immorality and the morality of the law switching back and forth, you know, most people don't see the connection between the alcohol prohibition and the more extended and egregious cannabis uh, prohibition <laughs> because of the propaganda they've been fed their whole lives. You know, there's, there's still people to this day that I meet, you know, usually in the the older generation of the conservative parties that I come across that still believe like reefer madness was for real like they really believe like they still believe that hardcore ridiculous stuff that they were either force fed as children or their parents were force fed and then passed <laughs> on to them like they still honestly believe that because they've never bothered to try and they you know the the media and the bureaucrats are, are wonderful at cherry picking the stories to put out to the public to say well th this is the bad thing that could happen and you know and like like you said Cindy, uh, oh it could happen to me you know the the really weak-minded people will automatically panic and just say oh well that could happen to me so we must ban it just as you said for the greater good because they don't they don't make that connection to, to failed prohibitions and trying to do the same thing again, which also ties into what we were talking about earlier about, you know, how criminals don't obey the law. That's what, make them, that's what makes them criminals. So they're not going to <laughs> stop. And it's not people that weren't going to, wouldn't break an arbitrary law in the first place are not going to be further protected from breaking said arbitrary law with the law in place. So it only leaves the, the people in the middle who may or may not do these 
horrible things um, that don't affect anybody else but themselves. Right. And they're the ones who get punished. They're the ones just trying to live their lives and just trying to get, you know, whatever it is. You know, whether it's, whether it's they're in a rush and they don't want to wear their seatbelt, whether they just want to, at the end of the day, unwind with instead of having a beer, like, is, is perfectly accepted. You know, they want to come home and light up a joint instead. You know, that's how they want to relax. But they're a horrible person because government has dictated that that is uh, illegal um, and they don't want to, you know, most people don't even want to question that. They just want to say, oh, well, 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 where, where's the studies that say it's good? Well, government made it illegal. Nobody was allowed to study it for decades. <laughs> but again, nice. pick up, pick up a, a, a medical book from, from, from the early 1900s, you know, and you'll see where all of these quote unquote illegal narcotics were used for a myriad of things to help cure and prevent and, and, and do all this stuff. And then all of a sudden one day, oh, nope, not anymore. Now we're gonna, make, we're, we're gonna make, we're gonna make this schedule of drugs. And once you reach this certain plateau, you can't use it for any purpose. And it's, it's just ridiculous, but people just don't want to see the connection. They'll, they, they look at the, the god of government and say, well, they, or they, they take, like you were saying, Danilo, with the angle with the people and, you know, we're the government and blah, blah, blah. It doesn't matter. Whichever one they want to use, they will justify, well, it was, it was made illegal for a reason and then it was made legal again for a reason. And, you know, like I said, whether they think the people had something to do with that or whether they think that government is good and, and did it for the right reasons. Well, it sorted itself out. So it, they, it hasn't sorted itself out now. It, it must not be time yet. It must not be ready. It's like, but if it, if it happened tomorrow, what would you say? Like that blows most of their minds. You know, most, most, most especially the conservatives that are so staunchly anti-drug. What would you do if it was legalized tomorrow? How would it affect your life? You know, and they don't want to answer that. They, you know, it's all... And, and they, it, also, they, it also goes down to the... Uh, like, if I walked outside and saw my neighbor smoking a, a bong on his front porch, would I feel justified going over there with a gun and saying, hey, I don't want you doing this on your property? I mean... Like, if you're not willing to do that personally, yourself, if you would not do something, like if there's a law on the books and you wouldn't feel comfortable doing it yourself, not comfortable, but justified in the right, doing it yourself... Where does someone else get the authority to do that? How do you give someone else that authority that you don't feel justified even using? Yeah. I mean, it's called, it's called magic. You, yeah, and they, <laughs> and they tell you, you know, yeah, they have the authority. And I'm like, where did they get it from? And why are they using their authority to tell me what I can and can't do with myself? You know, they're, you're going to learn your limit with drugs or you're going to die, period. That's what you're going to learn. And what I've learned from drugs or watching people use drugs, people tend to kind of regulate themselves on it. You know, sometimes it's a, sometimes somebody can be productive and, you know, go about their day and everything, or sometimes they can be a bum. It just depends on that person, but you can't save everybody. And the fact that people use the government as some sort of fountain of youth to try to keep everybody alive longer and everything, no. Nature is supposed to sort shit out. The stupid people are going to touch the electrical boxes. The stupid people are going to do all kinds. They're going to drink the paint. They're going to eat the paint chips. They, nature has a way of sorting shit out. Okay? Stupidity is illegal. It, it, I mean, <laughs> just, it's just illegal remove the war. to nature. Stupidity is illegal in nature. Okay? That is nature's number one law. Don't be stupid. <laughs> and you will make it out of this alive. I promise. It's true. It's true. Just, you know? just, just remove all the warning labels and let, let, it, let things sort themselves out. That's I would like to know, hard. honestly, here's another thing that I think just damns the whole, the whole argument. How many people have been adversely affect, affected not by the drugs themselves, but by the drug laws? So I would just like to know a body count of how many people have actually died from marijuana use versus how many people have died due to the United States drug war. And we'd have to add up Mexico because they're adversely affected because they signed on to the, you know, the whole nation or the whole planet-wide ban on controlled substances, whatever. And you'd have to look at all of Mexico, pretty much all of South America, lots of Canada, that people have risked growing weed there. How many people have died due to 
drug enforcement agents killing them or them dying in prison versus how many people have died using these drugs. I guarantee you it's a 90 to 10 ratio. It really is. Oh, or, yeah. or probably higher. You know, the cop told me, he was like, hey, I am saving your life right now. <laughs> I was like, nigga, I'm in the back of a cop car. <laughs> I'm about to lose my job over this. Oh, two, two joints, two little roaches this big. I'm about to lose everything over this. You know, I did. I ended up losing my job. Ugh. I had to find another one. Thank God I found I found one the next day. You know, I was like, I am not, I, I told him, I was like, I'm not some bum out here. Everybody you arrested has a job. You know, we had shit to do tomorrow. He was just filling his arrest quota, dude. Yeah. Just, that's it, really. He had know? three in one night. I was like, well, congratulations. I hope you love that toaster that they give you guys at the end of the month when you make your quotas. <laughs> because... Well, well, federal, there's federal drug enforcement like incentives, right? So if they arrest like 12 marijuana, if they have 12 drug arrests a month and convictions, they get more grants money and they get more funding from the federal government. So they yeah, have, they, they got have, a whole new fleet of fucking 2015 Tahoes, so all white. So there's no incentive for them to show any leniency in drugs because they're incentivized because it's a boondoggle. Oh, this is costing us this much to use uh, to fight the war on drugs. And then they spend all this money outfitting all these these local police departments and federal police departments and and sheriff's offices and et cetera, et cetera. Oh, we spent this much money. We need this much more money next year. So, I mean. And you know what, what really, 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 really bothers me about the black community? And I don't even know why it does, but it does. They like to bring up Obama and weed and, you know, and uh, one day Obama's going to make it legal and Obama's going to do this and Obama's the savior and Obama with the drug war. And you see he put a stop to it and everything. I'm like, guys, if he has the absolute power right now to make all drugs legal. He does. And you don't have to worry about it, you know. Why wouldn't he do it? I'm like, why are you guys depending on this one person to tell you what you can and cannot do with your own life? Who the fuck, fuck Obama. Who is he? I don't know him, okay? And I'm being honest. I don't know him. I don't know any of the pilgrims that are sitting in Washington, D.C., making signing off legislations. I don't know these people. And I didn't sign any contracts saying that they have some sort of authority over my life to send hired goons to kick in my door and arrest me over a plant. You're telling me that the God that you people are swearing to is wrong? So that God messed up when he made weed? That's how I get the Christians. <laughs> yeah, I, I just want to go back to uh, what Cynthia said before about uh, the chemotherapy, because I, I think that's, a, that's an excellent observation. For, first of all, I, I, think, I think it's important to clarify that what is banned are plants and what is legal prescription drugs are are Many like factors. several several times magnitude more dangerous than any plant substance and s many 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 more people die of legal prescription drugs than have ever died from plants or mushrooms or anything that <laughs> grows in the earth okay so so talking about chemotherapy that is something that has really been a focus before I even got into volunteerism, I, I was big into you know learning about nutrition and Monsanto and GMOs and all that stuff, and then learning about the FDA and and about about um, you know how how it's illegal <laughs> to treat cancer with anything other than chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery. Right, those are the only three uh, practices, medical treatments that are legal for cancer treatment, and everything else is harshly illegal. And it's just so amazing how how these, you know, I, I, I've seen, a, I've read about a bunch of them, like, uh, like the Gerson therapy, like the Essiac therapy. There's like, um, uh, hot, the Hoxy therapy. This is like so many, and, and most of them are, are herbal, you know, in nature, or like raw organic uh, fruit, vegetable juice, juices, and things like that. 
but it, it's a, it's like people are more afraid <laughs> to take a raw organic vegetable fruit juice than they are to inject themselves with chemotherapeutic agents, which are themselves carcinogenic yeah. and kill people. And they would do it just because it's legal. On top of and that, <laughs> think of the it costs my mom and uh, my mother had her the doctor she worked for had some sort of kidney cancer. He can afford to pay fifteen hundred dollars a month for one pill. Imagine somebody else like me or you having to pay fifteen hundred dollars a month a pill, and then this pill is releasing toxic poison into your veins. Yeah, and there is a guarantee that the cancer will come back, even if it does go into remission. It's never truly gone, and it's been proven over and over that that even even the ripe ripe bananas help fight cancer. Even cannabis oil helps fight cancer. It's a lot of things that help fight cancer. Vitamin but you can't use, vitamin, yeah. Yeah. Oh, was, you yeah, can't overdose. use those. No, they want you to use this poison. My sister's hospital bill was half a million dollars Ooh. when they got done. She was in there for 30 days, half racked up half a million dollars. They had a hundred doctors. They flew a doctor in from Boston to diagnose the cancer that she had because none of the doctors had ever seen it and they didn't know what it was. So they were like, okay, well, we're gonna have to do extreme chemotherapy. And then from there, it just went downhill. You know, and then, I mean, I've seen more people die from chemotherapy than the actual cancer itself. Yeah, there was a story of a, my mom was telling me one of her one of her friends at church or something was like, I'm not getting chemo. I just want y'all to pray for me. The doctor said I have six months to live. And uh like it something killed him ten years later after that. Yeah. Like you know, he I, he refused to do any chemo. It was like I, I knew people that And it, and it wasn't even cancer related. Anything. It was it wasn't even cancer related. It, it, like he had a uh, I think it was a, an aneurysm or a stroke it killed him. I knew a guy, he was a, he was lived to be about 80 some years old and they told him that he had prostate cancer and that they were going to have to operate on him and everything and do chemotherapy and he told them, I'm not doing any of that. He said, I'm going to continue to drink my olive oil and my liquor and I'm going to go about <laughs> my life and he lived for years after that. He lived for years with that, doing that. You know? Well, there is now more uh, about prostate cancer. Uh, there is more facts and facts facts coming out that if like if if men could live indefinitely they would eventually get prostate cancer so what you have to do what they do now is you can get an elective procedure when you're about 70 68 men usually get prostate cancer around that age around 75 around 80 to go ahead and get it while you can still heal from the the surgery go ahead and get your prostate taken out so it doesn't give you any problems uh, later in life. Yeah. But yeah, the the whole drug war is just so fascistic in nature just due to how much it props up so many corporations, props up so much government programs. It's just such a ridiculous boondoggle. The 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 addiction rate for hard drugs was 1% when they started the the drug war in 1970 and it's still at 1% 35 years later or 45 years later yeah so it's been we're, generations of the drug war so we're seeing that no amount of government interjected because they've spent a trillion dollars and like a trillion dollars is like if you had one dollar bills you could you could rebuild the twin towers with dollar bills like <laughs> that's uh, they've just been hemorrhaging money into this and you know we're the ones that's paying for it and people don't realize you know you're paying for this drug war that you're against you're paying for people making their own decisions you know i just why the can't government ever back out why can't they ever go ah we're gonna go bankrupt if we're doing this and why can't they back out i've never understood that about government this thing is bad for our budget why can't we back out guys they can't do that because that would be it, admitting we're wrong, and that would be shutting down some of their power. Well, it's, it's not part of the plan. The, the plan is always to expand, never to shrink. You know, that's, that's evident by 
just looking at history and seeing every form of government. You know, they well, they, government they, doesn't they're, run they're, a profit. They always yeah. they, well, it, well, it's not their money. Exactly. Yeah. But the, 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 the people who end up in charge, especially in in the modern day, with with everybody, just about every nation state in the world under some kind of fiat system, it's number one, not their wealth. Number two, the money's fake. So they're just taking and whatever money they take from the system um, and, and then supposedly pay their fair share back into is stolen from somebody else too. And they just take the fake money that they get their hands on first and turn it into real wealth and everybody else just keeps getting poorer. So no, they don't, they're not, they don't want to pull back. That's, that's not part of the plan. They, they need to keep pushing forward. You know, the whole, the whole drug war thing obviously, yes, is, is, is silly and it's, it's going to keep going until enough people recognize it, but it's just like anything else. You know, the, the war on poverty, same, same statistics. You know, it, everything was on the decline until the war on poverty started, and then it started to creep back up again because they're not actually doing anything about it. They're not even trying to do anything about it. The goal is to convince people that they're doing something about it by saying that all this money is needed and that to ease the pain of having to fork over more of the fruits of your labor in, in the form of you know extortion that they've labeled taxation and you will keep believing that and then you know that going back to what you said before dave about you know the the people not not seeing uh the, the different possibilities here and how you know chemos and and radiation are the only options well yeah because the propaganda has taught everybody that the FDA, the USDA, the CDC, these are the authorities in, in these areas. So what they say is what everybody else should follow. And, you know, you follow well, what the, the FDA or the CDC is saying is goes to the highest bidder. Well, exactly. That's what I'm, that's what I was going to get to. They, you know, of course, whoever wants to pay is going to, is going to get the regulations in their favor. And that's why chemo and and radiation and and those type of treatments are the only ones that are not just recommended anymore that's the only option you have in most states because it, it is illegal to use other options i mean the fact that certain states now are finally starting to pass laws to allow people in end of life scenarios to try different treatments is like like that is patently absurd the fact that you even have to explain that to people, like people have to ask for permission when they have already been giving a death sentence. Mm. And they are looking for, they are willing to grasp at any straw, spend whatever money they have personally made or friends are willing to give them or whatever. Like they are willing to do whatever it takes to try but something. But here's the thing, those cures are free. <laughs> Well, yeah, of course. That's why yeah, they want to keep it away from them. Yeah, you grow your own them. cure. But that's, that's what I'm saying. The, the fact that people have to ask, per, like the fact that this doesn't just ring in people's minds, that you have to ask permission to try to save your own life, yet in a lot of places it's illegal you're to just kill not yourself. Thinking, like, you're just not seriously? thinking about the greater good, Jeremy. Yeah, you're just, Jeremy, you're just really what's not, wrong man. with you? What about stop, everybody? What about, just, what about peace rest, and okay. love? Come what on, dude. Oh. Yeah. You are messing yeah. up the kumbaya rainbow yes. here. Hey, two each according to their ability, okay? <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, it's it's a shame though cuz yeah, like, you know, like you said, there's so many people that, you know, like you like you were saying Cindy about your sister, like you never know. Like my uncle too. My my uncle passed away from cancer and he was somebody who would have been willing to try just about anything. Um, you know, but here in New York it was illegal for him to do at the time, so he went through the chemo and the radiation and it sapped the ever you know it sapped the life out of him and he they thought for a while he was going to get better and then they kept dosing him and dosing him and then he got even worse and then he passed away and it's like you know would it have saved him i don't know it's it's impossible to know but it's also impossible to know when they don't even give you the opportunity to yeah and and to have to you know it's the, the drug law the drug war in general is obviously to people like us is completely ridiculous because you are attempting to legislate morality and tell people what they can and cannot put in their own body, whether it's for recreation, whether it's for medicinal purposes, whether it's to attempt to save your life. 
it doesn't matter. It's your body. Why does like the fact that anybody is that much of a busybody that they have to exactly. prevent others from dealing could, with their own? Could is it just, be that we're just state property, Jeremy? Well, yeah, we, we are. We are um, state property. Yeah. And Actually, all of our Jim, names are in capital letters on our on our <laughs> identifications. We're yeah, state Jeremy, property. That, that, that kind of reminds me, I think it was George Washington that died um, because his doctor used bloodletting at the time. And uh, and he was getting weaker and weaker as, as he was progressively draining him <laughs> of his blood. And the doctor was like, don't worry, we're almost cured. We just Let me just drain a little more blood <laughs> until he finally died. And, and that's the go. kind of... The, that's the kind of the same thing with the chemotherapy. It's like you're getting progressively weaker, weaker, you know, a poor immune system. And, and the, the thing that usually kills them is the opportunistic infections, right? Not necessarily the cancer yeah. or, or the treatment itself, right? The, the toxicity of the, of the cancer uh, of the uh, chemotherapy agents. It kills all the cells. And, and they said, yeah. you know what? If, if only we had a little more time, we could have saved them. Yeah. And, 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 and it's the smart people that actually resist and say, you know what? I think you're killing me. I'm going to stop. And... And 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 what's amazing is that the the people that do the Gerson therapy, for example, like like there they have their uh, their treatment uh, facility in Mexico, and and the people that they get there are like completely terminally ill, like end stage cancer. Like the the people that the the physicians or the oncologists have told them, you know, there's no more nothing more I can do for you. Get your things in order, you know. Uh, you know, talk to your family and loved ones. This is the end, you know. And then they say, you know, what? I don't accept this, and they find something else. And they go to Mexico, and they have like like eighty to ninety percent success rate with these terminally ill patients, and uh, and then they go back to their their oncologist. And they're like, like, look what happened. <laughs> you said I was going to die, and you can't find the cancer anymore. And they're like, well, I don't know what you did, but it's good. I, I mean, I mean, it's like they they don't even wonder like. Is something that I'm doing <laughs> killing no. people? <laughs> you know? No, that one doctor got busted for giving chemo to people. He would fake that they had cancer because he had a chemo quota he had to make for the for his clinic. That's awful. And they sent oh, yeah. it, they sent him to jail, which I mean, hooray, Mark went up for the state, but that's ridiculous. I mean, he was he, he was killing people essentially. Um, how many people, you know, and how many like people Like two or three hundred people, two or three hundred people. Oh, wow. Yeah, he, he, he would, they would come in, oh, I got, you know, I got a lump on my neck. It would just be like some benign tumor or something. He'd be like, oh, you got cancer, we got to start chemo right away. Because he was getting extra money from these chemo companies to yeah, yeah. sell their product. And yeah, well, what they sell is yeah, death. I mean, yeah, I mean, the same Doctors thing with any, do any physician. Get that. Yeah, yeah, doctors do get uh, incentives. Um, I know a doctor, he got a trip for prescribing <laughs> yeah. this antipsychotic to a certain amount of people. You oh, know yeah. what I'm saying? And this is like in our neighborhoods and stuff, you know, like you're releasing this this person into our neighborhood with this antipsychotic that they really don't need and now it's actually made them psychotic. And so now... The state gets involved again because somebody's running ass naked down the street with the broom, you know, saying they're Harry Potter. <laughs> it's all of this could have been prevented, you know. I mean, the, the doctors are greedy. Everybody's all the legislation and everything. They're every they're all cooped in together and they're all very greedy. And they've convinced the masses that you know it's not greed. You know, we're looking out for you guys. You know, we want to make sure that you're okay. And it's like, you know, you've been dousing this per, you've been pumping this person with radiation and chemo and stuff like that for like six months. And they've done nothing but lost weight, hair, everything. They're dying at your mercy. And you will not change your regimen. I don't know how a doctor sits down and sleep, it sleeps at night. It's almost like, how does a, a soldier or a police officer, you know, when they go over and they're not defending their homeland, it's like... But see, they don't sleep at night, and people don't know that. I mean, cops and every they're always off in themselves and shit like that, and they have drinking problems, pill-popping problems and stuff like that. They're cheaters. A uh, friend of mine, you know, finds out her husband gave somebody else, because uh, cops in Houston, or cops that I know of, they get free apartments here. In Texas, you know, you get a free apartment, even if you have a house, 
Oh, well, that's, not, wow. that's not that's not welfare. Let's say you're you're guarding, uh, you're doing a watch over an apartment complex. You get a free apartment in that complex, wow. no matter what. You know, nice. they use it for their girlfriends and stuff like that. Ooh. Well, they're they're heroes. They deserve special perks. Well, of course. <laughs> you know, I mean, so, I can't go up to somebody and say that, oh my God, that's a tacky sweater, and write them a fine and everything. I don't get awards for that, but I should. <laughs> so, Cynthia, if you had to tell someone who was kind of teeter-tottering on um, an anarchism, <laughs> <laughs> uh, what would you what would you say? What would you say, especially if they were, you know, uh, black or whatever you want to call it? Release the god, release the gold, oil, and drugs that you've been indoctrinated to believe are. You know, your savior, it release the government that you think is going to save you from the end all be all. Release all of that. You need to start thinking for yourself. No one can save you but you. There's no law that can save you. You know, you have to start thinking for yourself. You all have to start doing for yourself. And the when our society gets back to being self sufficient, Instead of being dependent on the government and dependent on religion and dependent on doctors and stuff like that, once we become self-reliant again, that's when peace will come. But until then, the tensions are going to continue to rise. Everyone's going to continue to be upset because everything's processed for you. Everything's programmed for you. And you all know that this programming is wrong. There's something inside of you telling you that something's not right. And you need to listen to that voice. Yeah, it always cracks me up. They're like, oh, the the, you know, the black people down in the, the severe destitution areas of, like, Chicago, New York, whatever, Baltimore. They're, oh, the cops are killing us. They're beating us. They're racist. And then they go, okay, well, and the cops stop doing their job, which has happened in Baltimore recently. And they go, oh, we, we need the cops again. They're, people are getting shot. It's like, how many of these people that just got shot over this Memorial Day weekend in Baltimore were gang members like i would really like to know i would yeah i would bet a large majority of it so they were going to die whether the cops were there or not you know and people think that it, you don't need to have your life policed to live it safely just use common sense i mean people act like they have to be told what common sense is now you know what you should and should not do people have lost their morality listening to laws you know <laughs> trying to follow laws and everything everybody's lost their, a lot of people have lost their basic instinct that's why there are labels on everything i mean you that's know good... there's signs everywhere that says don't cross here don't cross there you have to go a certain speed or you have to do this in order for you to be safe you don't need that yeah, that's it brings up an interesting point that uh that Somebody uh, was commenting on uh, on some of our posts, which was, uh, you know, how the, the non-aggression principle is inefficient because what are the limits and who enforces it? <laughs> you know, when do you determine that the non-aggression principle uh, requires the use of defensive force? And what is defensive? You know, it's like it's like it's like this is the mentality of people wanting to be told what to do and wanting to be told what is right and what is wrong. Or right? they, they think uh, the nap is a law. Yeah. 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 Like, like it's called morality, and yeah. and if you if you weren't taught morality as a child, that's quite unfortunate because it should be something that's inherent in every human being, you know. And if you really need laws, you know, just pieces of paper to tell you how you should treat your neighbor or your friend or your family. I think you have bigger problems in life than the non-aggression principle. <laughs> right? If you have to have a gun to your head to tell you not to run over little kids while they're crossing <laughs> the street for school. It's the just, law. Yeah, you know, you probably you're a bad person. I'm like if you need if you need someone to hold you hostage to tell you to be a good person, you're a shitty person. It, you are a terrible person. There, I said it. Well, I, I just look at it as, you know, when people say that, you know, that, that it's, there's these laws, there's, there's got to be laws, um, you know, to what you were saying, Cynthia, I don't think, I, I mean, I think there are some people that actually think there needs to be 
stuff to tell them what to do but more often than not at least what i come across is is it's always the other guy these laws need to be in place for the other guy not me i wouldn't do these things i i don't need i don't need that but it's these other people or you know or if they want something banned or they want something outlawed or whatever it is it's like well it's these other people that could use it and you know i'm a good person i don't need that stuff I, i i try to ask them well if you feel so strongly you know, to what Dave was saying earlier about, you know, if you feel so strongly that something needs to be changed, something needs to be banned, something needs to be um, curtailed, you know, if you're if you're not going to use the gun yourself, then it is a cowardly action to have somebody else use the gun instead. But if it's a matter of having something taken away from other people, every time you get that urge, every time you say there or you think there ought to be a law or this thing needs to be banned or this is a bad thing and and nobody should be allowed to have it before you say those words out loud or before you start pressing the issue try to put it on yourself think of something that you like think of something that you use on a regular basis and imagine somebody saying the same thing to you how would you feel you know and that's what a lot of people don't realize because of that whole greater good phenomenon they lose track of the fact that you know, for, besides the fact that we're not actually free here, even though we're told, we're, we're told we are, most of these people don't really understand what freedom is. Because it's not just the freedom to do what you want. It's, the, it's, it's also allowing others the same exact freedoms. So if you don't want somebody micromanaging your life, if you don't want somebody telling you what you can and cannot do, what you can and cannot have, what you can and cannot put in your own body, any of these things, why do you feel the right to be able to tell somebody else the exact opposite? You know, and, and, and most most people I encounter, if I get to that point with them, the ones that do have critical thinking skills will start to think about it. The other ones just reject it on its face because they've been convinced that the law is good. So if it's the law, it must have to do with morality. And if somebody like me is questioning those laws and saying they don't need to be there or this doesn't need to be banned well i must be the crazy one because they know they know better because they they believe in the system it's it's a uh, it's a tough road to <laughs> tough road to go down with these people but that's that's where i try to bring it to with them and ask them you know how would you feel you know if, if your favorite substance was suddenly banned and if they say it's ridiculous well just look through history it happens all the time it's legal one day, legal, uh, illegal the next. And just like that, you know, so it's, uh, it's, it's not too hard to connect the dots. You just have to be willing to look. So, so Dave, any uh, cl- closing remarks on the, on the drug war? I, I mean, I've, I've stated various times my feelings on it. I, <clears throat> it creates a welfare class for the DEA. It creates a welfare class for the prisoners. It creates a welfare class for the um, police unions. It creates a welfare class for the private prisons. It creates a welfare class for the prison guards. That's all created by one edict by one man in 1970 who was paid off by fascistic corporations to do so. So if you think that's moral and legitimate, then I would then think it would be also moral and legitimate for you to go swimming in the ocean forever just go 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 find atlantis go 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 find atlantis for human society but, but you know? dave suicide's illegal though uh, hey they're just exercising <laughs> um they exercise to death i don't know i it just if you feel if you feel like your neighbors or your fellow humans shouldn't be doing something in any case, if you're not willing to do that uh, to stop them by force yourself, then you're an absolute coward for wanting someone else to do it for you. And you should really not exist on the planet. <laughs> but I- I'm kind of a means to the ends on that, that subject. I-, I hate welfare. I hate legislation that creates welfare. And I also hate fascism so there's a big three-way problem here happening so i I, it's dave's just not happy if you think that government (laughs) if you think that the people wanted the drug laws you're absolutely insane 
Cynthia, any uh, closing remarks on the drug war? The drug war is a drug is a war on us. There, there is no war on drugs. You can't tell people what they can and can't do. You can't have some authority that has been deemed authority by some magical entity tell people what they can and can't do. You know, people have to make their own decisions, and people have to go through things in life. And you can't prevent everybody from hurting themselves. You can't prevent everybody from dying. Life is going to happen. Nature is going to take its course. If somebody's going to OD, they're going to OD. Sorry that your family member died. But coming up with the law against somebody using heroin or somebody using this isn't going to prevent anybody else from dying. There's going to be people that die from heroin overdose. So all these, I guess, war uh, on drug laws have just created more criminals. And, you know, the longer they drag this out, the more criminals they're going to come up with. And, you know, the more they're going to perpetuate the sla the prison slavery and stuff like that. So the war on drugs is a total bust. Like, who's worse? The Jack smoking a joint on his front porch or shooting up heroin on his front porch or the guy putting people in cages for doing something that he doesn't approve of. Who's worse? What, what? Seriously. Yeah. It's so fucking stupid. It is. <laughs> I, I like, people don't connect it. <laughs> I like, I like uh, you know, what you said. It's not a war on drugs. It's a war on people. I guess more specifically war on addicted people most often um, and, and, and uh, I, I was listening to a, a Gabor Mate interview with uh, Stefan Molyneux and, and he's an excellent uh, um, you know a researcher on this topic um, and basically saying how many of the people who lead lives of addiction it doesn't really matter what they're addicted to you know it could be gambling could be could be um, you know um, you know, hallucinogens could be cocaine, could be heroin, could be sex, could be work, could be anything. It's just when you're when you have an addictive personality, you you have basically already started life at a deficiency. You know, you are an incomplete human, right? Spiritually, and what produces incomplete humans is most often authoritative parenting, right? Corporal punishment, right? Uh, <laughs> the, the 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 kind of the kind of punishment that prepares a child for the uh, obedience. And compliance that is rewarded in government schools. So, so it's it's a it's a it's not a war on drugs. It's a war on people because when you arrest the person, the person goes to jail, not the weed, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, exactly. so it's always, it's, it, it's always the war on addicted people. And it's quite unfortunate that its foundation is rooted in statism, right? Statist type authoritative parenting, which is why it was so important uh, for those that have kids to raise their children's uh, children children peacefully. And rationally and logically, and raise them to have principles and to learn morality. <laughs> you know, your child begins to feel empathy and, and is able to reason for themselves. What more do you expect of a person just to have reason and, and able to think for themselves, which unfortunately is not encouraged in government schools, right? It's just, it's like, you know, you go to school, you get told this is what you have to do, these are the instructions, this is how you play. You don't play like that. You play like this. <laughs> so, so yeah. Well, uh, thank you very much uh, for coming on, Cynthia. It was a wonderful conversation. Thank you guys for having me. This is awesome. This was this was better than I imagined. <laughs> so you're gonna have to start a, uh, your own fan page after this because you're gonna have so many people wanting to talk to you. And I didn't even have to flash anybody. <laughs> oh my god! Like I thought I was. I, have I expect I expect to see Cynthia Wells, anarchist extraordinaire, with a <laughs> Facebook page when we get off. Oh, I know, and I'm gonna be like, nigga, we made it. <laughs> nice. Awesome. Thank you very much for the conversation. So if anybody wants to donate, uh, we accept um, Bitcoin, PayPal, right? So far, just just those two, right? No, we, we canceled PayPal. Oh, we have a Patreon PayPal, right? now, oh, patreon.com slash Seeds of Liberty. I'm going to be updating it soon. But uh, if you really want to help us out, you can always just uh, take a little picture with your, your Bitcoin app of our QR code and send us as much Bitcoin as you want or go on to Patreon and sign up and... Uh, Send us uh, one dollar a month. If a thousand people do that, that would be great. <laughs> so, yep, yep. Um, helps helps us keep keep the lights. And also up. the uh, Amazon uh, link through on our webpage. 
Yeah, all that you yeah, can be found in the description box. Uh, help us keep the lights on. You see, Dave's already without lights, so we need to. You know, all the help we can get. <laughs> they barely stay on. <laughs> so uh, anything you can throw at us is uh, is very much appreciated. So thank you very much. This is the Seeds of Liberty podcast. Well, actually, everyone. Actually, you don't even have to donate to us. All you have to do is like, comment, share anything you see from us. That is the best thing you could do. That's yeah. Those are free free ways to help us out. So yeah, there's many ways definitely to improve improve the lives of you you and your neighbors and our grandchildren and uh, you know future <laughs> future <laughs> generations. So thank you very much. This is the Seeds of Liberty podcast. Wish everyone have a wonderful day. Take Peace. care. Bye. Bye.